This morning, we'll be working through a topic called the Tao of Finance. This morning's session is the second of the WAS Mentorship Program sessions. And we will be hearing from Stefan Brunhuber, I hope I pronounced that right, who is a member of the WAS Board of Trustees, is our presenter for this morning's session, as I just said. He is a socioeconomic economist, psychiatrist, and psychiatrist who has actively engaged in the activities of WAS for the past five years. As an active member of the New Economic Theory Working Group, he has introduced new approaches to fund the UN Sustainable Development Goals by a creation of complementary cryptocurrencies, specifically designed for investment to achieve the agenda of 2030 targets. He is currently medical doctor and chief medical officer at the Daikoni Kliniken Zarstras um, and chief medical officer of the Department of Integral Psychiatry, Psychosomatics and Psychiatry, Psychotherapy. This morning session, as I mentioned, we will engage both um, Dr. Brunhuber as the junior fellows, and we'll also welcome the participants to pose questions about the topic of today. The main premise that we're discussing is that development needs have primarily been financed through private sector financing, conventional public sector funding, and philanthropic commitment. These sources are not sufficient and in scale enough to speed up the, mean, the need to um, meet the identified pressing needs. The world community is too busy repairing, stabilizing, and refunding the system to maintain the stability of the existing system. The argument today is that the introduction of a parallel electronic currency specifically designed to finance global commons and human-centered economy would provide the necessary resources to achieve the UN SDGs while stabilizing the existing monetary system. Today's format will essentially be a brief presentation, roughly 30 minutes from um, Dr. Brunhofer, and then followed by several questions from my fellow um, junior fellows, and then open discussion with the other participants. Without further ado, and thank you very much again for joining us this morning, I would like to hand over to Dr. Brunhofer to give his introductory presentation. Hello all together this morning and all over the world, wherever you are associated to. Thank you for having me in your show and thank you for your interest in this topic. The idea of this mentorship program is not to provide you stuff which you are learning in your faculty training anyway. So it's not a competitive uh, program to what is happening at the university, but it's rather complementary. Complementary in the sense that it should basically um, provide additional information and additional knowledge even that can be challenging what you learn at the faculty or what you learn your, in your day-to-day -day experience. About five years ago, um, in September 2015, actually six years ago now, uh, the UN decided to come up with a new roadmap. It's the UN SDGs, you've heard about that, right? And we have the political consensus for these 17 goals. We have the scientific evidence for these goals. And we have the technology, how to do it, more or less. But what's missing is the question, how can we finance all that? And Gary, Jacob, CEO of the and president of WAS, and me and, and a group of, uh, of fellows decided to come up with an initiative trying to answer that question. How can we finance SDGs and how can we finance our common future? So I would go through this argument in four sectors. The first one is I would like to introduce a Western and an Eastern narrative. Second, I would like to introduce the term of the Anthropocene. Third, I will go into the specific argument of the Tao of finance, which basically outlines the necessity to upgrade our financial system and our monetary system. And then I will sum the entire argument. 
And at the end, I'm happy to discuss further uh, issues with you. <clears throat> what do you think is the um, selection advantage of the human species? It is not the opposition of the thumb. It is not walking right up. It is not having emotions. It's not the speech and mental processing. It's not living in groups. All these things you will find in other animals. The selection advantage of humans compared to all other species on this planet is that we can tell each other stories about something that actually doesn't even exist in the outer world, like a legal system, like God, like the monetary system. And we tell each other a story about that and, believe, and we trust and believe in all these stories. And this trust and this belief in that narrative can basically coordinate behavioral change of millions and billions of people. And if you look at the Western approach to narratives, the Western approach to storytelling, we in the West, we are very powerful in analytical thinking. Our stories are based on a narrative which is more experimental, which is more causal, which is more, as you say, um, case-based. The Western approach provides significant insi insight into scientific findings, but the Eastern approach is actually different. The Eastern approach is not so much about finding causal links or experimental findings. It's more about complementarities. It's about understanding the whole of the society, the whole of nature and its interactions. I'm getting back to that. If we consider that we're now living in a new era, and Paul Krusen joined this, uh, coined this in a nature paper in 2002 called the Anthropocene, where first time in world history, humans are sitting in the driver's seat in order to influence and cause geological and ecological changes directly. You can look at this from a very long perspective. We can look at this kind of the last five seconds of a very, very long story. And this red dot in the middle presents where we are right now. And if you look into the past, the story started, let's say about 10 or 15,000 years ago, called the Holocene. About two and a half thousand years ago, Kaliaspas called it the Axis time where rational thinking started. We had in the 16th century, the first Renaissance, the first enlightenment, and the first adaptation described by Charles Darwin. And now we're entering in a phase called the big acceleration where the humans are basically determining the outcome of our planet. And this shift is a shift where we start entering a new form of adaptation maybe a second form of enlightenment, maybe a second form of renaissance, maybe even a second form of axle time. And this era is called the area of the Anthropocene. And one of the major things in this shift happening is, is a shift in our mindset. If you look closer into this era of the Anthropocene, we are operating within planetary boundaries, and we are operating in an era where everything is connected with everything. We have major feedback loops and tipping points, and everything which is happening within this era is basically happening 
in an exponential way. You know, this is a publication from uh, the IPCC a couple of years ago. You know these data and you know these graphs showing that within these seven, eight, or 10 different planetary boundaries, we've exceeded already three climate changes. One, the nitrocene cycles is another one. The right of biodiversity is the third one. And there's others where we basically exceed the planetary boundaries. In such a situation, um, we are reaching multiple tipping points where linear thinking, where analytical thinking, where causal thinking is replaced by systemic thinking and integral thinking. In order to better understand these overshots, in order to better understand the complexity of such interactions, we require a different narrative and we probably also require a different way of dealing with this narrative. The UN SDGs signed in in 2015 with all these 17 goals was the largest UN um, program ever done in order to find out a new map for the future. And as I mentioned in my intro, we have the scientific evidence for each of these goals. We have the political will for each of these goals. And we have the technolo technological know-how how to do it. We know, for example, how to overcome poverty or hunger. Each human needs about 1,500 calories. We know how to set up a hospital and train a nurse. We know how to build a kindergarten and to provide high-end uh, high education. But the question we left out at the UN and the process of the last five years is, how can we finance all that? How can we really enact all these goals within the next 10 to 15 years? And if you look at UN sustainability development solutions, there is a lot of solutions out there. We have to change technology, for example, number two. We introduce geoengineering or renewables. We provide additional sinks. We change our demographic patterns. We change science. But there's one aspect we constantly overlook. And this is the design of the monetary system and the design of the financial system itself. And what we're talking about today, in order to get the figures right, is we're talking about 5 trillion US dollars annually over the next 15 years. What you see here is financial assets on the planet about 240 trillion. Our global GDP is about 80 to 85 trillion. The remittance payments are $550 um, uh, uh, billion, dollars, et cetera. So this is the figure. This is the volume you're talking about, which is required roughly over the next 15 years, every year, in order to finance our future. And the question is, what is required? is additional liquidity at very high scale and at full speed, which is basically targeted towards SDGs in an intelligent and wise manner, and which differs of what has been done in the past. So this was the task we had in the first place for our working group coming up with the solution to answer that question. And what is interesting is if you ask orthodox and traditional financial officers, experts in finance, central bankers, regulators, ministers, politicians, and we ask them the simple question, okay, we signed in for the SDGs, we need 5 trillion and, we'll, and we need them for the next 15 to 20 years. 
Where does the money come from? You probably do not get a sufficient answer on that question. Traditionally, what we're doing is we either have to grow 10% every year in order to redistribute that money, which is not compatible with our, um, with our planetary boundaries, or it will take us about 100 years in order to finance SDGs. There's data out there who can demonstrate that, for example, if uh, we want to reach the educational standard on the global level, we have in OECD countries, it will probably last three generations in order to achieve that. So what is the traditional approach? I would like to ask you two questions we're going to discuss later on. And I will give you the answer later on. What is the common denominator between the US petrodollar system on one side and the Chinese Silk Road? The US petrodollar system installed in the 70s of the last century was basically meant to provide enough energy for the US American um, people. And the Chinese Silk Road on the other side is an international trading system. And despite their look different, they have one thing in common. And the second question I want you to keep in mind is what would happen if an s -read hit Europe and 10% of Europe would be destroyed? How would we, how would we manage such a shock? So the traditional way of looking at such a shock, whether it's an asteroid, whether it's the carbon bubble we're sitting on, whether it's the loss of species or another pandemic awaiting is that this yellow, this yellow um, arrow basically resembles our value chain. On top, you have the central banks and then the commercial banking system and then the real economy. And at the end of this value chain, you're basically taxing or feeing that value chain in order to finance SDGs. And on top of this, we have to manage a lot of damage control. The cost for damage control exceeds by large the amount we are redistributing in order to finance SDGs. And in addition, just keep in mind this gray, uh, this gray box in the left, we have a shadow economy where illicit transactions, fraud and corruption feeding into this value chain, stabilizing with this value chain, but pulling the entire economy in the wrong direction. So if you ask a traditional uh, macroeconomist at your faculty, how can we finance our SDGs? How can we finance our common future? They will tell you, we either grow 10% every year on the global level and redistribute that money, or we, we re remain within the two or 3% of growth pattern over the next 100 years and do the same. But either way, Either way, this story we're telling each other in order to finance our future is not appropriate. Why is financing SDG so difficult? Why is financing asymmetric shocks like pandemics, species losses, or even an asteroid? Let's make a fictitious story so difficult. The entire system we are operating in, the entire financial system, the banking system and the currency system is tremendously unstable. You can measure empirically about 10 events of banking crisis, state failures, state bankruptcies, or currency crisis every year somewhere else on the planet. 
And this leads to multiple so-called lock-in effects. So whenever there is a crisis, we try to repair the given crisis in order to stabilize the given system without having a real impact on SDGs. If you have the time to look closer to these SDG programs, you will probably recognize that about one third of these SDGs are eligible for private funding, meaning you have, can have a private investor being involved by building a sewage system or a highway or a hospital. But about two thirds of the SDGs are global commons. And global commons require a different financial schema to enable them. And what is interesting, if you look into the literature and into the research finding of commons is that they have an extremely high return on investment. The Copenhagen consensus, which was installed about 10, 15 years ago, um, they tried to come up with measures on what is the return on investment on every dollar we spend on global commons. And global commons have a return on investment, which is by factor 10 or factor 100 higher compared to the amount of money you invest in. So for example, if the world community decides to invest $1 in education, the return is five to seven to even 15, 20 times higher within the next years and decades. So why financing SDGs is so difficult? Finally, it's very difficult because we have a black market, we have illicit transactions and an informal sector, which pulls this value chain I showed you in the previous graph into the wrong direction. This is a graph you know from your textbooks. It describes what sustainability is all about. It basically describes the triangle of ecology, the social world, and the real economy. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with the common denominator between the three. In fact, this picture, in fact, this narrative you're telling each other here is inappropriate. We have to look at it from a different perspective. I think if we try to bring in finance and the monetary system into this equation, the picture and the narrative you're telling each other is a different one. It's more like, it's more like a funnel looked from above where the monetary system is kind of an attractor in the center of it, determining the outcome in the real economy of goods and services in our ent entire social world and its impact on our planet. So if we tell each other the wrong story and if we use the wrong frames and we use the wrong pictures, we end up with the wrong solutions. But we can revise this Western narrative of finance. The first thing we have to take into consideration that sustainable finance is not the same than financing sustainability. Sustainable finance simply describes how can we make the financial system more long-term, whereas financing sustainability describes what is required in the financial system in order to finance our future. The second thing is traditionally finance drives sustainability. Meaning even if we have the brightest ideas about how to come up with a drug 
against cancer or a vaccine against the next pandemics or money in order to reforest the sub-Sahara. When there is no money, these projects will never be able to happen. It actually should be the other way around. It's not finance drives sustainability, it should be sustainability driving finance. And within our current narrative and orthodox finance, we're always telling us the story that we first have to tax our value chain. We have first have to borrow money from somewhere in order to spend it. This idea of taxing and borrowing before spending is a myth. Money is, money is not a thing. Money and finance is not a natural law. It is probably, as Gary Jacobs writes in the seminal paper for Catmus, you should read that, money is probably one of the most important inventions humans ever did. It can literally translate a bag of sand into a PhD, into a hospital, into housing, into a better future. And it depends on us how we design that financial system in order to make out of weapons of mass destructions, which there have been um, characterized in the 90s and around the millennium, into tools of massive social and ecological investment. And if you look at the entire debate of the last 20, 30 years on finance and sustainability, I've been involved to some extent, you find basically two general approaches. One is we spend our entire money and entire energy and our entire time repairing the given system. We increase regulatory efforts, we increase taxation and others, or we spend our money and our time and our energy and our wisdom and creating an additional parallel upgrading system that interacts with the given system. And the question we've been asking us in our workshop and our commission is, does that happen already beyond repairing the given system? And what you find empirically, there's three fields in which this paralyzation of the given currency system, of the given financial system is happening already. You find since about 10 years, private initiatives on so-called cryptocurrencies, private currency systems like Bitcoin, stablecoin initiatives, or the Libra initiative of Facebook, which is now the DM uh, initiative. You find since about 75 years, globally, four or 5,000 initiatives all over the world of so-called Re regional currency systems who try to fix local problems by introducing an alternative complementary currency system, or since about three to four years, central bankers started to introduce so-called CBDCs, which means central bank digital currency systems. All these three initiatives Central bank digital currency system, about 50, 53 central banks on the planet are basically using this already and trying to introduce a parallel system already. Regional currency systems are happening since 75 years and cryptocurrencies have a market capitalization of about 300 billion already. This kind of parallelization is happening already. And the question we've been asking in our working group is if these trends are happening already, how can we 
understand these trends and put them in a framework that allows us to really meet our unmet needs and to really hedge our unchecked risks in order to finance our future. If you kind of put the entire debate on the traditional way in one graph, you can see that there is five steps. One is we put all our effort in regulating the system. We harmonize our rules and codes. We increase transparency. We introduce ECG standards or social corporate responsibility standards. The next step is we introduce additional carbon tax, for example, or we subsidize renewables or de-invest in the fossil industry. The third step is basically addressing the private sector where we start encouraging impact funding. The fourth step is we come up with alternative strategies like new hedging instruments, like swaps, derivatives, asset-backed securities, in order to hedge our risks. And the fifth step is we start with blended finance. It's basically private, partner, pub, uh, private public partnership programs, which combines the private sector and the public sector. This, these five steps, five steps basically describe the conventional way to do it. And if you combine all these five steps, and try to make the best out of it, you will come up with the conclusion, you will very likely come up with the conclusion that these five steps are honored and they're important, but they're not enough to finance our future. There's a sixth step missing. One of our members of the working group uh, was working at um, um, taxonomy and um, how to evaluate um, Standard & Poor's um, uh, firms all over the world. And what he found out is about 15 to 20% of the entire greening process can be done within each firm. Meaning if you have a firm out there and say, you have to become greener, you have to become more long-term, you have to become introducing ESG standards, about 20% of the entire process can be done within the value chain, chain um, upstream and downstream. But after these 20%, the firm, if he wants to introduce more of sustainability, basically has to quit the market, which means 20% can be done on a corporate level. The other 80% depends on the systems change, meaning we have to change the incentives, allowing us to shift the entire firm, the entire economy, our entire society towards a greener future. So what's missing in this six pack is from our perspective, not repairing the given system and not introducing another tax and not enhancing private public partnership, but rather introducing a parallel currency system, allowing us to shift from the fossil industry towards a green marketplace. So can we do that differently? You remember I showed you that graph in the first place with the value chain, the orange value chain and the SDGs? So can we do it differently? Can we introduce a parallel system? And this is happening already. And why, why is such a dual digital currency system in favor of our common future. 
If you look at this graph, you see this green big arrow that introducing such a parallel system is not redistributing money. It's basically pre-distributive. It provides the society with additional liquidity in order to finance our future. Second, it provides targeted liquidity. Targeted liquidity means we're using third and fourth generation blockchain technology, which allows us to directly target our SDGs with a smart contract. And having such a dual digital currency system in place, we suddenly create multiple positive feedback loops for the entire system. And we end up in a world where the monetary monopoly is basically replaced by a monetary ecosystem. And we end up in a world where we start honoring the complexity and the uncertainty we are facing in the age of the Anthropocene. In our report, we could show that introducing such a dual currency system, we basically end up in a new form of equilibrium, economists called Pareto superior. So this is the traditional way, and this would be the full picture. You know, from a, if you, if you, if you use a narrative, you would say, we start riding a bike with two wheels instead of a unicycle. This makes the entire system more stable, more predictable. And we start really financing our future by introducing a new currency system. I'm not going to go with you through this graph, but we were able to identify about 30, 33 impacts of such a dual system where we then start replacing these weapons of mass destructions, as they're sometimes called these financial engineerings, into tools of massive social environmental invention. A dual currency system will overcome illicit transactions in shadow economy, number nine. It will cause number 25, tremendous positive distributive effects with regard to poverty and hunger. Okay, we will start entering a world where we don't create only windfall revenues, 29, but create multiple so-called second round effects. Just imagine if we stayed in a monetary monoculture and we would invent uh, windmills or renewables, upstream and downstream the value chain, everything would stay the same. In a dual currency system, we would start creating multiple second round effects. Each time you use this green dollar, each time we use this green currency, we would basically create one step closer to a common green future. I give you one example. We've created about several hundreds of them. And in fact, there are several thousands of them of permutations possible if we start introducing a parallel system. Look, this is, a, this is the, the conventional way to do it. The central bank is providing money for the commercial banking system and the commercial banking system hands out a loan to let's say a pork farm. And the pork farm is taxed. And with this tax money, we basically create a preschooling, a kindergarten. The pork farm itself has several negative spillovers, which are subsidized and creates negative externalities, ecological and social externalities, for example, with regard to water and health and CO2, with a negative impact on our community. On the other side, with this tax money, where we create 
a nursing home for, for kids, this creates positive spillovers on wealth, on health, environment. It reduces birth rate, et cetera, et cetera. This is the conventional way to do it. But we can do that differently. This is shown in the next slide. The same central bank in place provides a loan to, to the commercial banking system and the commercial banking system decides to hand out a loan to a pork farm. And the pork farm still has to <clears throat> create its porks, but creates negative spillovers to the community. But the central bank at the same time funds preschooling to a multilateral developing band, creating positive spillovers. We start separating the private from the public sector. We are separating the revenues from the private and the public sector, and we start funding our commons. We start funding our, um, our global commons in a different way. So at the beginning of my intro, I ask you two questions. What is the common denominator between the US petrodollar system and the Chinese Silk Road. Despite their different projects, the common denominator is the money system. Be aware, just be aware, whether it's the Yuan Renminbi for the Chinese or the US dollar system, in both cases, we have countries with a convertible currency rate, currency system with a convertible currency. And if the US government decides to create a petrodollar system with the Middle East, they call up the Fed and say, we need so and so many trillion US dollars. And the Fed provides that liquidity to the Ministry for Trading or Energy. And the Ministry for Trading and Energy takes that money and issues projects for the commercial banking system and the real economy to find that petrodollar system. There's nobody taxed in the US to fund the petrodollar system. The same is true for the Chinese Silk Road. The Chinese Bank of, uh, People's Bank of China is creating the UN, the Yuan and the renminbi out of its own in order to fund, for example, an airport in Myanmar along the Silk Road all the way to Europe. They're not taxing the citizens to do so. Second, what would happen if an asteroid hit Europe and 10% are destroyed? You can replace this picture of the asteroid by the pandemic, you can replace it by the loss of species, or you can replace it by the SDGs or the carbon bubble. Let's say Europe has, has been hit by an asteroid and 10% are more or less destroyed. Would we really tax the 90% in order to fund and rebuild the 10%? We would never do that we would generate additional liquidity to finance the 10% beyond taxing the 90%. This is why we are in favor of a more holistic approach in finance, which differentiates between the public and the private purse, the fiscal and monetary policy, and such a dual monetary system has about a dozen of such positive impacts on our common future. Let me summarize the next two minutes. I think when we're talking about the future and the entire sustainability debate, we're always good in debating and discussing technology. We're good in debating uh, uh, policy for demographic changes. We're good in debating lifestyle changes, like becoming a 
becoming a vegetarian or riding a bike. But we've overlooked the impact of the monetary and financial system in this entire equation. And this requires more of a change in our mindset than a change in technology. And if you look at the real tragedy of the commons, the real tragedy of the commons is not that they're misused or neglected, because you know, fresh air will always stay fresh air. And attending uh, a kindergarten or accessing a healthcare system will always stay the same. The real tragedy of the commons is they have to run within a monetary system, within a financial system that favors private revenues and underfunds the commons. You know, psychologically, and I say that as a shrink from Germany, we are trapped in by the idea that there is just only one monetary system in place providing a single specific liquidity for all purposes. And we assume that the allocative distribution through that monetary culture is the most efficient and effective way to do it. In order to change that, we have to change our mindset. And we can do that technically in less than 18 months and with less than 200 people staff to make that happen. The real tragedy of the commons is not their overuse or free rider as you learn in your textbooks as fresh water and clean air or kindergarten will remain always fresh air, clean air or kindergarten. The real tragedy of the commons is the underlying financial system or incentive allowing to enable fresh air, clean air, uh, fresh water, clean air, or a kindergarten. This is why we called our initiative uh, the Tao Finance Initiative, because it's more an Eastern narrative, not a Western narrative. It's not only experimental, linear, causal, analytical thinking, it's more holistic. It's more complementary. And Tao in Taoism describes the best practice, the best way to do it. And the Tao finance is best described as introducing a dual currency system. This was the initiative of the last five years. We have uh, uh, multiple study papers out there and uh, our book financing uh, our future is now available on Amazon. We are currently organizing roadshows on a domestic level, and I'm starting in the Ukraine in October, and then I'm going to Iran and other countries. And if you're interested in uh, supporting us, um, please contact us, and I'm happy to discuss this initiative more in details now with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very thorough foundation for us to begin having the discussion. I would like to kick off with a question from Gary. Um, he has asked, where does the additional money come from? What um, value is it based on? Is it created out of something or nothing? By pre-distribution, do you mean we create the money now and generate the value later? By the way, is by the way it is invested or do you mean that we create additional money out of trust faith um, of the society in the value of the central bank central bank or unmonetized value of the society in which the money is invested or there is another way to explain it better i think by virtue of those five or six questions <laughs> we wow. can have a debate all in of itself so yeah 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 let me let me uh, let me uh, put it this way. You know, the co in the conventional value chain, money is fiat money. It's created out of nothing, and then uh, we hope and trust that the money is creating additional values and additional wealth 
for all of us. By introducing this parallel currency system, we also create that money out of nothing to begin with, right? Uh, it doesn't. It does not differ from the way it's done in the past. However, it's collaterals. It's backed up by our global commons. So I would assume that having a dual currency system in place, the green dollar and the green euro marketplace is very likely to have a higher value than the fossil value chain. And every dollar we are creating for this green marketplace has a long-term view and therefore has more stability than the old one. But from a technical perspective, the money is created in the first place out of nothing, but it's conditioned to be financed in commons in the first place or in the second place. I think that's, that's the major difference between um, the traditional way and uh, the complementary way. What, I, what was an eye-opening for me when I uh, discussed uh, this issue with Stephanie Kelton, one of the lead um, modern monetary theorists from the United States, is that she said, you know, we really have to be aware that we can create clean bills. Let's look at the entire process from the end, from the targets. We decide at the world community the projects we want to fund. We have unmet needs out there and we have unchecked risks out there. And then let's identify the financial engineering required in order to really finance all that. We're still driven by the opposite narrative. We're still driven by the idea that finance drives sustainability, which is wrong because most of the projects will never happen in the next decades if finance drives sustainability? Why financing reforesting the sub-Sahara? Why overcoming poverty and hunger? Why installing 30,000 kindergartens uh, in Northern Africa? There is no private market for that, never. But if we look at it from the other way around, saying we have the mechanisms at hand, we know how the monetary system functions, we don't have to tax our value chain to make them happen. And we don't have to borrow the money from the private investor sector only to make them happen. But we create this additional liquidity and invest it wisely into our commons, which are chronically underfunded. We create a balance between the private and the public. And both can actually benefit from it. Right? And if you look, if you remember this graph I showed you with the pork farm and the preschooling, <clears throat> if we start funding our commons in a different way than the private sector, <clears throat> the private sector involvement will basically disentangle from subsidies and taxation. The owner of the pork farm will be very likely to be taxed much less and subsidized much less. And if he decides to create pork farming as a business model, he can do that, but then he has to, um, he has to cover the entire costs along the value chain, right? So you, you would disentangle with this mechanism all the debate on subsidies and taxes and fees for the private sector. Mm. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, there's a comment and a question from Rajani, Ravi, but I'd yeah. like to just jump into the question uh, itself because it, 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 it puts me in that space as well, because the, the question is, um, as a non-economist, what can we do? Um, which includes youth and other WASP fellows um, from our end to address the issue. Regulation and re-engineering are acts taken at the level of policymakers. How can WAS leverage its diversity to address the issue and turn it into an opportunity? 
Yeah, uh, we are. We are also asking ourselves at the working group how to uh, get this into a, a general knowledge. In general, the first thing you can do is on a on a very concrete level ask your political representatives, ask your people in your uh, NGO groups to come up with the financial schema and how to finance our common future. And if they cannot give you a, a good answer to come up with this liquidity over the next 15 years, then refer to the WAS initiative. The second thing you can do is um, what we are actually doing within the next couple of weeks, we are addressing between 50 and 75 world opinion leaders in the field, like the head of Fed or the head of the Bank of England or the ECB. And we sent them our report and tell them, look, you don't know how to finance our future. We can provide you a rationale and a comprehensive narrative uh, how to do that. And third, you can simply help us multiplying and supporting our initiative through social platform and social media. And fourth, which is probably the most important, ask critical questions. Ask critical questions to us, you know, as the working group and to your community on money and finance. Money is not neutral. Money is not a neutral veil, which is basically covering the real economy. It's simply uh, represent, represented by the price. It's not a thermometer you stick into the water where you measure the price or the temperature or something. It distorts or enhances our real economy and our output from the very beginning. I'm having a personal moment here where I'm, I'm wishing that you could walk into my intro to economics classes professor because what you've just described right now is things back in the undergrad years that I couldn't quite articulate where what I, what I was hearing didn't resonate from with the communities around economics and how money moves but I think that's a discussion for for another day. Um, I have a question here from Arian Ruta, um, basically also thanking you for the presentation and doubling down on one of the points that Gary had made. And he's saying with respects to Gary's questions, um, could you provide greater clarity and could you please explain your thoughts surrounding how the implementation and creation of these new currencies have an effect on the real economy and how this would have an impact on inflation? Yeah, especially the inflation issue <clears throat> is a very critical one here in Germany. Um, but you look, look closer to the debate of the last three months. <clears throat> uh, the New York Times asked the te top 10 economists in the world to explain inflation, right? And there's four or five narratives out there. The first one is the Milton Friedman narrative. Whenever there is an increase in base money, we have an increase in price of the real economy. No empirical evidence, zero. The second argument is um, Phillips curves, no empirical evidence. The third one is trying, um, the third one is the so-called psychological inflation expectancy. So the uh, economists say, well, inflation occurs whenever there is expectation of increasing prices. If you look into the history of inflation of the last 75 years, almost with any exception, inflation happened when a country was indebted by a foreign currency they had never control of. And if you look at, for example, Japan of the last 30 years, they pumped huge amounts of money and created huge amounts of base money in the first place, but were never able to reach their inflation targets. <clears throat> so at the end of this interview of the 10 top 10 economists on inflation, 
They had to admit to say, we really do not understand how inflation works. So if that's the case empirically, we can turn the argument around and saying, if we don't know when inflation really happens, why not looking at it from another angle and saying, let's identify the targets we want to achieve and then create the liquidity to make them happen. And if there is inflation happening, we have two mechanisms in hand in order to fence it in. The first one is taxation. And the second one is interest rate. Central banks can increase their interest rate and withdraw basically purchasing power from the real economy. And the same is true for governments. This is the basic, uh, the basic uh, uh, purpose of taxation. We need taxation in order to tackle inflation and we need taxation in order to redistribute wealth within a country. But we don't need the tax money in order to finance SDGs or our commons. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you for that. Um, I would go with um, K. Chitra. I hope I pronounced that right. It's a question and it's, did, do, you, do you believe that the cryptocurrencies are the only solution for shadow financing? We have fewer amount of cryptocurrency and how would it help the whole system and even more the cryptocurrencies have high price volatility okay. and how could it help for us to generate more money for the SDGs? Yeah, yeah. well, if you enter, I'm a member of this advisory board for the blockchain uh, community here in Europe, which feeds into the so-called Mika regulation at, on the EU level. And if you have this debate with the private cryptocurrency uh, scene, what I'm learning is most cryptocurrency, um, no, almost all private cryptocurrencies purpose is they provide a speculative tool to increase private wealth. They have no purpose to increase common goods, right? So if you invest into Bitcoin, for example, or others, you can make a fortune or you can lose a fortune, but you'd not necessarily create uh, a country, make a contribution for our common future as a common future. This is why I think this private cryptocurrency movement on one side provides an interesting indicator. It indicates that our given system is broken. Our given system is not enough and appropriate to finance our future, but introducing private cryptocurrencies, which are unregulated, is not the solution either. So what's required is so-called semi-permissive, fully regulated, distributive ledger technology-based digital currencies issued by an authority like the central bank. And um, with a smart contract. And a smart contract is a digital algorithm that allows the user to use that money for specific things and prevents it to use it for other things. And there's two UN studies out there already who tries to do that with blockchain technology in Africa already. Um, they send with blockchain technology do two US dollars on an iPhone in um, a refugee camp on each of their, um, uh, um, uh, each of these uh, people there and the people can go shopping. And if you introduce a smart contract along this blockchain technology, for example, you can uh, code that this money can be not used to buy alcohol or to buy a Kalashnikov or to buy cigarettes, but you can go shopping to buying fruits or sports shoes or books or water or food, okay? 
So what you're introducing with this blockchain technology, you condition the consumption, you condition the investment into our common future. We agreed on already in 2015 to begin with. You know, in 2015, we, we agreed that we want the SDGs as our common roadmap. And what's missing is the right financial incentives to make that happen. And by introducing this blockchain associated conditioned smart contract incentive, each time you touch that do- green dollar and each time you use that green dollar, you create multiple green so-called second round effects. Uh, we create a preschooling setting and all the money along the value chain that comes out of this green preschooling system can be used again for green schooling or green projects. And this allows us to shift from fossil into the green marketplace. There's, I I recently spoke with um, 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 an investor group on this, the impact of such a dual system on their own assets. Let's say you are an investor at BlackRock and you're sitting on $500 billion um, on coal mines. Let's say you invested in in thousand coal mines all over the world and you're realizing it is a carbon bubble and you're losing your asset every day a little bit. And you're operating in a zero or negative interest environment. So what do you, what can you do? If you're living in a dual currency world and the green dollar provides you a slightly positive interest rate. So let's say 0.2.5%. But your investment is conditioned into green projects only, what would you do? You would create a so-called swap. You would actually create a a financial engineering called an X swap. You take your 500 billion, go to the CEO of these thousand coal mines and tell, hey guys, the time is over. I give you money to exit coal industry. And at the same time, you use the rest of the money to swap into a green project with, a, with an equivalent nominal value. Let's say 500 billion into reforesting the sub era. And parts of that 500 million billion swap is hedged by World Bank funds. And then suddenly BlackRock will make that shift because it gets a slightly positive interest rate. Technically speaking, this is called a positive carry trader, yeah, which is well known in, in the financial engineering. And they do this between different currency systems anyways, it's about 30, 40 years. But by introducing this green currency system, it suddenly becomes an incentive to swap your traditional ancient fossil projects into green projects. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I see here that the question that Marta was going to ask has been answered by some of your um, examples given. But um, to, and the, the, the general question was how do these um, parallel green currencies interact or intertwine with the, the real um, regular currency and economy. But what you do have is a question and I think in part you've touched on it, but um, I would still like to ask it so that you can elaborate on it. Um, Arion is asking, um, how do these new green currencies convert into real economies? If a companies are paid in SDG currency, how does these companies convert SDG currency earnings into usable currency? And as, for example, as a construction company who is building schools, etc., will they need, to, how will they be paid and how do these companies convert back into transactional currency? Yeah, very, very good. 
This is a very uh, important practical question. Uh, if you look at the data to begin with, we're talking about five to 7% of global GDP. We're not talking about 100% global GDP. So gradually over the next years, more and more money of our, let's say brown dollars will be gradually replaced by green dollars. And each time you touch the green dollar, you invest into something which is more sustainable. And if this green dollar of this green euro is accepted as a means of payment, you pay your wages and you pay your taxes. And suddenly your commun communal bodies get additional green taxes. And these green taxes can be used to reinvest into green regional projects again and again and again. So what's happening is we have two systems in place over the next 20, 30 years where we shift from fossil to green. And at the end of the day, there will be a, um, um, there will be a, um, um, a conversion rate um, between the green dollar and the brown dollar. Of course, this is happening between the, the conventional currency systems too, but it doesn't matter. As long as the value within the green marketplace is higher, people rather would, pre, uh, would prefer to stay in the green marketplace instead of the fossil marketplace, because each time you invest into global commons, you invest into longevity. Last week, I had a debate with, uh, with the CEO of Allianz. Allianz is uh, the Europe's largest insurers. And they find this idea fascinating because their entire business model, their entire identity is built on long-term stability. Everything short-term volatility is their enemy. They're only interested in long-term investment and every financial structure that provides them long-term stability is their friend. And they are, these financial officers understand that if we have this in place, suddenly their traditional assets, if we swap them properly and wisely, suddenly don't lose value, but gain value. Yeah. So I, I have, several con comments, but I'd like to go back to the, the question that you asked about the different, and I'm taking this opportunity because I see that there are no questions in the question boxes. Um, but back to the analogy that you made about the petrol US dollar and along with the Chinese Silk Road. Um, yeah. I think the main point that we're speaking to there is inventions where groups of people came together to decide what was valued. Right. Yeah. Um, and then accepting that. So what we're speaking to right now on the one, one very real sense is acceptance that the current dominant way of doing things isn't necessarily going to solve for the greater common good. I think that's one um, premise that we, we need to look into in a very serious way. But then second, yeah. also overcoming what is coming across as a false dichotomy our discussion seems to pit us in an either or, right? We, we're, we're currently yeah. have yeah. almost a block that says, um, if this doesn't solve it, that we've commonly accepted, um, then nothing else can. And that's not necessarily true. And I think a lot of the examples that you've given around, call it the swaps and the technical finance languaging, um, proves that behind the scenes, a lot of this is already being done and the intention now is to say, how do you use it for a common good? Yeah. And what then also allows is um, an opportunity to start solving from the solution and saying, if we want to achieve this, what needs to be in place and how do we essentially reverse engineer um, all the different components that need to be in place, transparency, um, real-time um, feedback loops and all the other aspects that you spoke to um, mm -hmm. during the conversation. And at best also then, I think the, something that may um, essentially not come out as prominently 
is that of, again, the SDGs, you have a third that's speaking to private sector mechanisms whereby the monetary system as we have currently accepted can continue financing those, but the two thirds can gradually start um, leveraging this type of technology and gaining trust in this environment. Um, this um, the tower of finance. What, what I'm curious about is two things um, given this context. What does it take to have a pilot? Because you're still speaking to us lobbying um, big institutions that are designed to take a long time to change. So to some of um, Arion and Marta's questions, if we're talking cryptocurrencies that have been used in the private space but are only in advancing private wealth, yeah. what does piloting this type of technology and the solution at a localized, practical, accessible level look like? And how do we get to a point where we have enough proof points to shift the thinking of these institutions? Do you have any answers of that? Are there any yeah. existing? Yeah, no, no, it's it's very good. It's very good. Um, I don't have probably a full answer on it. I'm currently debating uh, with the corporate world to fund a beta testing of our model. Okay, um, uh, we need 250k. I can have a beta testing done within six months. They can basically demonstrate that it works. And second, I'm currently working to discuss with two institutes, one in Vienna and one in Israel, on complex theory modeling. There's two uh, working groups out there who are extremely uh, high-end doing modeling, economic modeling, not with a neoclassical model, but with complex theory, artificial intelligence, big data modeling. And I want to win them to do modeling, non-linear modeling on our approach. And with these two next steps, having a model at hand, a modeling at hand and a beta testing, this would be huge assets to uh, confront uh, traditional financial officers and the orthodox economics with these findings. You know, but you know, there, there's different ways to support that. There's bottom up supports. I just had a last week a talk show with Friday for Futures here in Germany, and they are very in favor of uh, bottom up approaches, like creating pressure towards the executives and asking critical questions. On the other side, I myself, I'm more in a, uh, in a mode of providing a top down approach. I think. It's important to create pressure from the bottom and it's important to um, ask critical questions, really critical questions. But I think the solutions require also a top-down approach. We need the regulators, we need the political system and we need the corporate world in place uh, uh, at hand and supporting us. Um, and uh, speaking to this uh, CEO of the um, of this industry, uh, insurance industry, you know, if you have 250 people in one room, let's say at the World Economic Forum, or at the Bilderbergs, or through WAS, or through Club of Rome, 250 decision makers, and can convince them that this or very similar mechanism to this, meaning parallelization and digitalization is key to shift into this new era of the Anthropocene. Then we can have that done. This is not a miracle. It's, it's not too complicated technically. And you don't need a global consensus of 7.5 billion people supporting this. So I personally, but this is not a satisfying answer for you maybe, but I'm personally more interested in the top-down approach by convincing the decision makers and the executives, but we also need bottom-up pressure and critical questions at the same time. So Gina's comment is, thank you, Stefan, for the presentation. I want to emphasize that blockchain is a great way to reduce corruption which yeah. is a great argument to use blockchain to finance these SDGs. Yeah. And I think yeah. um, 
from a practical and getting a sense of how to go about uh, potentially with the execution, the question is, what kind of organization should regulate the green economy? Is the structural and, and functional capacity of today's international organizations adequate to implement such a mindset change? Would the fact that most of society is organized based on our current economic system mean that we need different ways of social organization and governance? And lastly, also how do political interests um, intervene or intertwine with uh, financing the SDGs? Yeah, I mean, you know, we had that debate with, uh, uh, with political officials uh, recently. Uh, I'm not sure whether we really have the luxury and the time to create new institutions. I would rely on World Bank for funding, developing banks for funding. I would rely on um, the UN on monitoring and state banks and central banks on issuing and the corporate world creating the technology to enable that. And if you speak to those who make the decisions in these fields, it's not a miracle, you know, you can, you can create this technology in, 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 for, on a European level, for example, in less than 18 months, this can be feasible, right? And you can do that with less than 200 people staff. But you have to change your mindset. You have to get rid of taxing first, borrowing first, creating debt load first before you invest in a kindergarten. You have to get rid of the fact that money is a thing. You have to get rid of the financial system follows a natural law. This is wrong. You have to, you have to get rid of the myth that finance drives sustainability. It's the other way around. So at the end of the day, I think it's really a matter of mindset. It's a matter of coming up with the right narrative, uh, more feasible to explaining complexity and uncertainty we are facing over the next 10, 15 years. And let's last sentence from my side, I would even reverse the argument saying not introducing this or a very similar mechanism to this will be just extremely expensive for our political system and extremely expensive for our economic system at the same time. So it's really worthwhile considering this or a very similar mechanism to this in order to finance our future. Thank you very much for your time this morning and for a very illuminating discussion. I think the biggest take home is, at least for me, is introducing the mindset of both and. So how do we consider um, without necessarily destabilizing, because I think a lot of people have that biggest fear um, when it yeah. comes to something new. How do we keep what is currently um, working, albeit as limited as it may be, um, while developing what could work better. And I think if um, that can be an approach, I think that can make for a very exciting new way of financing sustainability. Um, thank you very much for your time again, your inputs. Thank you for fellow, to the fellow um, panelists and also the participants online that have made the time to join us this morning. Thank you very much. You all have a great day and um, look forward to the next session. Ciao. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. All the best and keep in touch and hope we can see us physically in an analog world again, sometimes in the near future. <laughs>